Hello everyone, hope you're doing well. Today we have another answers from the developers done by BVVD or Vyacheslav Bulanikov and it is nice to see it to be honest every so often getting a nice uh, dev Q&A. There was a really interesting one in Cuisine Royale the other day which focused on a lot of issues uh, that I feel like are completely different to War Thunders and it is kind of interesting to see how different parts of the company deal with different issues. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through it as, as usual, um, you know, we'll uh, go through it and then I'll give my opinions generally on the answers. So let's start off with the aviation part. So the first question is, around a year ago, you introduced temporary measures for aircraft matchmaking above 7.7, which made mixed battles and allied, uh, sorry, allies versus allies, axis versus axis more common. Now, a lot of time has passed, and there are more vehicles and players at those ranks. Do you have plans to return to normal Axis versus Allies matchmaking? The answer is, first of all, we would like to say that the concept of normal matchmaking with Allied Axis sounds rather strange in relation to aircraft BR above 7.7. Basically, there are aircraft from times when the meaning of Axis or Allies didn't apply for existing alliances. The question then became, for which alliance uh, should we count Germany in such a setup? However, some time ago, a couple of months, we added to the top-ranked aircraft battles BR above 10.0, the possibility of creating matches not only all against all, but also nation preset against nation preset, uh, which means USSR plus China plus Germany against all others, because at that time top-ranked German aircraft were represented by aircraft from the GDR. This option proved to be well balanced, so we plan to add a similar option in addition to the current random, also to the BR range between 7.7 and 10.0. So they're not getting rid of the temporary measures. Um, I remember at the time when they talked about these temporary measures, I remember talking a lot about them no, not really being temporary, more being permanent. Uh, and the reason for this is because the numbers uh, at the top tiers of air realistic are a lot less than uh, ground realistic. So therefore, the idea of uh, matchmaking in aviation, uh, especially with the fact that a lot Lot of nations have incredibly similar aircraft right now would just pretty much just stay mixed if you have a look at it uh, overall you know you have phantoms running around from multiple nations you have mig 21s running around from multiple nations uh, and then you have a few unique aircraft such as the draken uh, from the swedish but then if you think about it where do you put something like sweden in a historical setup like this uh, like if you wanted to create a historical matchmaker where do you put somebody like sweden where do you put someone like italy where do you put someone like japan uh, if you wanted to do something like nato versus warsaw because obviously japan and sweden are not really part of nato or not a part of nato at all so this idea of historical matchmaking doesn't really work at high tiers especially the top tier but um, the other thing is they're going to do what reduces queue times at the higher tiers. I was sat at uh, 7 0, then I played a bit of 7 7 and 8 0 uh, the other day in Air Realistic, and I was sat in queues for six to eight minutes. It's as simple as that. Now, I was also the last few days playing the T 72A at 9.3 in ground. Most of the queues at the majority of times were one to two minutes if I was playing alone, and then if I was playing with people, maybe about three to four to five minutes. So it wasn't too bad. But in a realistic, I was sat as an individual player, so should have the best matchmaking possible. I was sat at six to eight minutes trying to get batches. Now, this is is going to put a lot of people off. I also saw a ton of the same people in my matches. So let's say they left, uh, then I'm not going to get, you know, it's going to take longer to get matched up because there aren't people replacing them in the pool. Uh, so at, at the moment, I think when it comes to these measures of mixed or whatever there are, of course, they're going to keep them because of the fact that so many nations have such similar vehicles to each other, but also because of the matchmaking issues at those tiers. And this is kind of just a fact of the game now. The fact that now, uh, in the last updates, you had added seven 104s, 
You also had added some more Phantoms, you know, then before that we had a bunch of MiG-21s. The variety at top tier when it comes to what you play is very, very slight uh, between the nations. And also pretty hard to grind, uh, if we're honest. You know, uh, the last two updates have seen five new American aviation vehicles, which are 380,000 RP or more. Uh, so for me, when I look at that, I think, well, that, that's kind of crazy, you know, uh, expecting people to grind that much over a small amount of period, a few months, and then, you know, going on to the next thing. So, yeah, I mean, it's nice they added the USSR China Germany thing uh, to represent the aircraft, um, you know, from the Warsaw Pact, if you want to pull it, put it like that, even though it isn't really <laughs> the aircraft from the Warsaw Pact, um, because you have so many different different ones as well from other nations so yeah it, it kind of is how it is i think they're gonna just keep going with the, the mixed battle idea and that's fine you know it, no, the most balanced game mode i suppose is you fighting yourself so that's what we're going to see the next, I just hope it doesn't spread to ground. Uh, I like one of the problems with mixed uh, battles is you don't really know, or you can't really sort out what you're up against because it could literally be anything. So if I see on the enemy team that, let's say I'm playing the Soviets and uh, I see on the enemy team uh, America or Germany or Britain, I can set up against those vehicles. But if it's literally everyone versus everyone, I can't, can I? Uh, but then again, if you just give the same vehicles to every nation, then I suppose you don't really have to set them up. Yeah, it's a, oh, the, the top tiers of aviation are very sad. The, at least in my view. The next question is, the current aviation maps are increasingly too small for Mac 2 capable aircraft. When can we expect larger air maps better suited to rank 6 jet gameplay? And the answer is the size of the locations themselves is okay. It's usually 64 by 64. Some locations have a size of 128 by 128. In the missions, the size of the battle zone and the distance between airfields can be really short for top-ranked jets. This is why we are reworking all aircraft missions at the moment so that the size of the battle zone better matches the flight characteristics of the aircraft. Some of the missions have already been redesigned or are in production server. The Smolensk locations, Guadalcanal, and also Berlin. So yeah, it's not the actual map that is the problem. It's actually the amount of the map that's being used is the problem. And uh, what this means is if you spread out the airfields from themselves uh, and then also spread out the amount of uh, AI on the ground and actually increase the battle area, then what this does is it makes a much larger area for these Mach 2 aircraft and it's good. You know, it's it's as simple as that. It works increasingly well. But if you decide to put the airfields within, you know, let's say 10 kilometers of each other and just say have at it with a sword fight, then of course it's going to be an issue. So it just seems like they're just moving back um, both sets of airfields from each side. And that is how they're going to solve the issue. I think this is fine. You know, uh, we're, we've seen a massive rework of a bunch of our realistic maps in the last updates. I think the majority of the reworks I agree with uh, because they've meant that there are now more targets um, for any vehicles that you play, really. You know, there, there's a reason now to play a light bomber. There's a reason now to play a lighter attacker. There's a reason now to play just a strike fighter instead of either a fighter or a heavy bomber. Now there are more things in the air which are accommodated for on these new map designs so hopefully in the future we get more aerialistic maps which are similar to this and i'm sure we will going forward the next little part is about ground forces and the first part is uh uh, I mean, it is how it is. The Stormer HMV is extremely inconsistent in terms of hitting targets and doing damage. Most of the time it appears to phase through or just in miss entirely, uh, making it very unreliable for anti-aircraft operation. Do you plan to... Uh, do you plan to do anything to improve the vehicle to make it more usable? In reality, uh, it should have automatic targeting, tracking, lock on, much like helicopters have for ATGMs, rather than having to manually lead targets. This sort of system could greatly help the missing targets issue if implemented, or perhaps introduce a new top rank SPAAG, such as the Warrior ADANCE prototype, tra the Tracked Rapier, or the Canadian 
ADATs. Well, the rapier wouldn't help, but the, the ADATs might. The answer is, according to our statistics, it isn't as described. Please show us the statistics. The efficiency of the Storm HMV is comparable to the efficiency of the 2S6 of the ADATs of the 7th rank in RB. It is the third place among all SAMs. So there is no need to, to implement a new SAM right now. However, this doesn't mean that any of the proposed vehicles will not appear in the game in the future. So the first problem uh, with this is this doesn't at all address what's going on. So, the Stormer HMV, if you haven't played it, um, the way that the rounds work on it is uh, they're incredibly fast. When you fire it, it splits into three darts. These three darts do not have proximity uh, rounds on them. They, they, do not, uh, they do not, when get close to a target, explode and do damage. What you have to do with these three darts is you have to hit a target in order to maim it. And sometimes, especially against helicopters, what happens is they either just go straight through and don't seem to do anything, or they uh, miss, uh, even though it looks like on your screen it hits. This is actually a problem that has been brought up before, and it's the same issue. It's, it's the old enemy <laughs> in War Thunder. It's the client versus server side issues. So what you see on your side of things is not the same thing that the server sees. Uh, so therefore you know stuff goes through things sometimes it can be a rocket sometimes it can be a tank shell other times it is the stormer hmv's ammunition uh, going straight through a target uh, so yeah that that is a bit of a problem so um, this means that because the Stormer HMV doesn't have a proximity round or a proximity missile, whatever you want to call it, it is uh, very, very rough to be able to uh, actually hit targets sometimes depending on your ping and also depending on your packet loss. So at zero ping, zero packet loss, the machine is probably incredibly powerful. Uh, because it's very easy to hit targets, all you have to do is track and uh, make sure the three-pronger goes in. But if you have, let's say, over 150 ping and packet loss every so often, you uh, will miss targets a, a decent amount. The other thing to also mention is helicopter DMs are very, very... Uh, what I would class as simple... Um, I, I think it's probably the best way to put it, and this means that uh, stuff like APFSDS or, st or stuff like darts, when it hits them, doesn't always do a ton of damage. Actually, a lot of the time, it may like hit something and uh, do a little bit of damage, and the Stormer HMV, the way that it works, is technically taking three of those darts and hitting you know, a helicopter with it, and sometimes it doesn't do a lot of damage and just goes straight through, so that's a bit of a problem. Now, the statement that uh, it is, so first of all, the, the two statements don't line up. The efficiency of the Storm HMV is comparable to the efficiency of the 2S6 and the ADATs at the 7 rank, right? If it was comparable, it wouldn't be third place. Do you see what I mean? They, they would be like equal numbers between them. So the statement itself is kind of annoying. It's also incredibly disingenuous because let's look at the other options. So you obviously have the two in the front, the Tungi and the ADATs. Very powerful machines, not just good at an anti-air roll, also have uses on the ground. Then we have the Florac. Yes, the Florac. Then we have the Roland. Both pretty much useless machines apart from trying to kill helicopters then and and also they need an upgraded missile in order to be more useful uh, which something the stormer doesn't need so the storm is as good as it gets out of the box then you have the new lv uh, brv or lvrv uh, which is obviously the missile platform on the um on the swedish made uh not ifv but the kind of like the the m113 um uh, swedish made box um it, it's obviously not an m113 but it's the swedish equivalent and that has a very dodgy radar on it 
it's it's also not exactly the easiest to use and the distance on the actual thing is not great uh, so those are your sam options oh the type 93 as well which just came out and has seems to have issues with its missiles actually doing damage so you can see it is not the fact that the stormer is incredibly good over all of these machines it is the fact that it is the best of the worst um, which is a much better way of putting it instead of saying it is comparable to the two best. It is very obvious that the 2S6 and the ADATs are very high in, comp in competitive competitivity. That is not a word. Uh, they're, <laughs> they're very high um, when it comes to competitive uh, play, but everything else is definitely a rung below. Now, maybe the Stormer HMV is a little bit above the rest, but it is not in let's say a glorious position now do i think adding something like the uh, automatic tracking to it will help no it won't it will actually probably mean that you miss more uh, all you have to do is lock onto a target and fire with that thing and then watch it as if you don't manually guide it in the, <laughs> the missiles will miss uh, quite a lot of the time especially if the vehicle is moving at a decent click so the way I see it is the only way to fix this is to add something uh, which would be, you know, comparable to it, uh, which would be the Canadian ADAT. The the tracked rapier system would not work uh, in the game because it would have the same issue that the Stormer has. It's useless in every other way apart from air. And you don't really want that in a vehicle. Uh, the other thing also to mention is uh, I would rather see, personally, uh, when it comes to the, the AA for the British, the gap between 4-7 four, four, and 7-3 be addressed. Um, if, well, I, w I might even say 3-7 to 7-3 because the Crusader AA Mark I is not very good. Uh, so the 3-7 the to 7-3 AA gap is much more something that needs to be focused on instead of the top tier Stormer, uh, which I think is okay with what it does right now. But that the fact that there's a gap there is not good. It is no bueno. The next question is, can you tell us why the USSR Ground Forces has been without the T-90 or, and later T-72 models for quite some time now? Uh, it is... Is it due to technical limitations? The USA already has the M1A2 Abrams and the Leopard uh, and the Germany, the Leopard 2A5, for example. Can we expect the T90 uh, or the more advanced Soviet MBTs to come soon? Uh, this is a hell of a question because I'm pretty sure we just had the T72B come out, didn't we? Anyway, now the answer is one of the most uh, perfect, if not the most perfect, serial Soviet main battle tanks, the T-80U, is already implemented in the game. It isn't significantly different from the M1A2 or Leo 2A5 with its build time. The regular T90 and even the T90A are inferior in mobility to the T80U and do not differ much from it in protection or firepower. What about plans to add it? Yes, we are already working on the T72 and several modifications of it, and one of the one of them might have been released in the last major update, <laughs> but for reasons it wasn't possible due to time deficit, so we plan to implement them in the next major updates so yeah the the t72b was added in 1.97 viking fury so it's not as if we haven't had any soviet mbt soon now <laughs> like viking fury came out on the 16th of march 2020 uh you know that that was only a few months ago um and obviously the main thing in that patch was the swedish ground forces but also stuff like the radkampfwagen the ztz 96 so I'd, i wouldn't say the Soviet top tier is hurting for a new MBT. The T-80U seems, uh, seems comparable uh, to the other machines that are around it. Yes, there are certain MBTs that are better than others. It is kind of interesting to see that the STRV-122 wasn't mentioned here, uh, because obviously that is top dog right now. Uh, I've definitely seen those things take over games uh, without you know really any issue. 
But the fact is, if they added the regular T90, the regular T90, I'm pretty sure, doesn't have thermals. Uh, it doesn't really have anything extra to it that would, apart from maybe the uh, the uh, anti uh, the the system. I can't remember what it's called, but the basically the the active protection system. There we go. The APS on it may be something that you're like, oh, okay, well maybe we want to add it with this. But the TADU is still doing very well. If you look at its general stats, uh, the other thing to also mention is it would be nice to see more modifications of the T72. I'm not exactly sure how they're going to do it, but there are many T72s that they can pick from to be able to, you know, have a bit of fun with. Um, I personally would like to see more of an expansion of other tech trees right now. I think China. Uh, when it comes to its top tier, uh, it would be nice to see an expansion of that. When we have a look at other nations, France, uh, it would also be nice to see uh, some other models for that as well. My guess is at some point what, what's going to happen at top tier is each nation is going to get either their 140mm prototypes or their L55 uh, prototypes or their L55 main production vehicles and then also the Soviets are going to get their 152 prototype and boom, boom, boom. Uh, you know, that'll just be how it is uh, for the next, you know, a uh, little bit or so. Massive guns annihilating pretty much everything. It's been some time since you gave a last update on the M60 turret and gun shield situation. Recently, we have seen a lot of new volumetric armor schemes being implemented. Can you tell us when we can expect the corrected M60 gun shield and, cur and turret with that values that were reported? And the answer is yes, we are working on the task regarding converting the M60 gun mantlet armor to volumetric armor technology. Good stuff. Now, that's always nice to hear. I remember in the past what they would talk about when it came to the volumetric armor is the reason why the M60 wasn't fixed in the current iteration is because they're going to fix it in the next iteration with new technologies, which would be the volumetric armor. And what we've seen is the volumetric armor used on many machines, uh, including the Object 279 uh, from the Space Race event. So to see that coming... Obviously, it's a new system. Obviously, it takes a long time to model. And yes, it, it would be nice to see an expansion of that over the next few years. Uh, so wonderful to hear. The next question is, is it possible to implement the ability of air-to-air missiles to hit ground targets? For example, the Type 93, which lacks other types of munitions, or the Sedan Mistral. Well, the Sedan Mistral has guns, uh, so that one's fine. The Type 93 is an issue. <laughs> I would definitely agree. Uh, the answer, which is wonderful, uh, because it's blunt, no. <laughs> no. Uh, first, it is not realistic to launch an air-to-air -air missile from a ground carrier to ground targets. Yes, we do know about test launches of the IR-guided air-to-air missiles on ground targets, but these vehicles will not benefit from this, since the missiles are too weak to destroy any ground vehicle except unarmored, lightly armored ones. However, we plan to give these vehicles abilities similar to light tanks, repair help and scouting, etc., to make these vehicles useful even when there's no threats from above. And I think that's the way to go. Like, and also, uh, I, I wouldn't make the this argument, um, because uh, what you've done over the last year is you've had a ton of vehicles at higher tiers which have no armor. Uh, so stuff like the STRFs, the CV-9120, uh, machines such as the Radkampfwagen, the BMP-2M. So may maybe don't use this argument about the how it doesn't do anything apart from, again, slightly armored stuff, because you decided to add a bunch of lightly armored stuff in, so you've now left yourself in a crux where, well, you know, it doesn't really do anything. Yeah, but what about all these vehicles? Oh, don't worry about them, you know what I mean? So, yeah, uh, that that's probably not great. Uh, but the other thing is the fact that they're getting light tank abilities, they're not just giving it, well, they instead of just giving it to stuff like the Type 93, they also gave it to, like, the Florac, the, the Roland, and other machines. I think it's good. I generally think those vehicles, I think they also gave it to the Stormer as well. Um, those vehicles do need a little bit of help when it comes to their ground support, um, you know, helping repair and scouting and maybe some other mechanics that they get, uh, which would be nice to see in the future. But overall, it, it is the problem with having a machine which is just a hard counter machine. It's going to be very good at one job and not really good at anything else. So you have to try and make up, uh, make up in other 
other areas um, some small advantages so not everything is a disadvantage and that's basically what we're seeing here and I think that's fine overall uh, at the moment if we see the type 93 be um, or the Roland or the Florac or anything like that take a dip in power when it comes to its missiles or something like that then we may have to have another conversation about how useful it is and you know whether these like hard counter machines should be added but at, at the same time I think it is it is better that we have the Type 93 in the game than we don't have the Type 93 in the game uh, which would be more of an issue the naval forces part so the admiral Grasby and the prince eugen slash admiral hipper class have remained a dominant power in naval forces since they were first introduced most nations still don't really have balanced counterparts to them which can make gameplay very one-sided against them do you have any plans you can share with us to address this matter and prevent such a situation from occurring in the future <sighs> I don't know how you would make that not occur in the future. Anyway, the answer is that a combat efficiency is no different from similar ships nevertheless. Most of the gaming nations have 8-inch guns, similar to the Hipper, sometimes slightly better, or slightly worse. Grafsby is outstanding here, but its high caliber is compensated with a higher reload time, so we can't agree with this observation. I'm happy you can't agree with the reality. Uh, that, that's completely fine. Um, it's very obvious uh, to the majority of people that play high tiers. It isn't, I suppose, just an Eugen or a Grafsby thing. It is mainly a Brooklyn thing and also a Grafsby and an Eugen thing. And since you've made it so vehicles can just face each other, then that already solves the issue for you. Uh, all you have to do is put it in writing. You have to say, well, how the, the reason why the Admiral Grafsby is balanced is because it can face itself. The same reason that you've done a top tier aviation as well so don't give me this shit about most gaming nations have eight inch guns so it is completely fine we all know that is not the problem here the problem is always the reload rates and the problem is the survivability of different machines and what their shells do don't treat people like idiots it is incredibly obvious what is happening in naval forces? It is a power creep game mode, and it's going to be going forward, because you need to try and force people to play other nations. So therefore, the next patch, or the next update, or the update after, there will be a new thing at top tier, which will take over the game. Just like the Eugen and the Hipper, just like the Brooklyn class and the Helena class, and the, and, well, sorry, the Cleveland class isn't in yet, but they got past the developers, uh, or something similar to that, or when the heavy cruisers for Japan were released. It, look... Please, for the love of God, it is very obvious what is happening at top tier naval, because it is how naval went historically. Guess what? Naval is really unbalanced, and that's what happened in history. Probably one of the most unbalanced things in the world, but anyway, yeah, it is how it is. The other questions... Uh, the question is, both naval forces and ground forces uh, maps suffer common issues with people having direct line of sight into spawns from reasonably early on from even dis different parts of the map. Do you have any general plans uh, to better balance and improve uh, maps by putting more physical terrain barriers in front of spawns to stop people from simply abusing map design? The answer is we have su such plans, and each update we make changes on maps, including those that were designed to solve problems described above. And they do. I mean, they, they did a bunch of minor changes uh, to Poland. Uh, they did a bunch of minor changes to other maps. Um, I don't think it's an issue in ground forces uh, when it comes to spawns. There really is only a few maps I can think it is an issue on, Corellia and Berlin, uh, which are two really bad maps uh, in the game. I would actually say are probably the two worst maps in game. 
uh, but I'd have to really think about it. Uh, and yes, it, it is definitely a problem when it comes to those maps. Um, but it, it, the, the Berlin one isn't the fact that you can look directly into the spawn. It's the fact that there are two roads out and that's it. Uh, so if you don't go down one of them, you have to go down the other. And guess what? There'll be at least one target waiting for you on the other side. So the, the idea, the, basically what this question is, is can you limit spawn camping? And in ground, spawn camping happens normally on the second or third spawn. By the time that one team has let the enemy team get to spawn camping positions, which can be counted easily from other areas, but for some reason people decide not to. Uh, so yeah, that is an issue. In naval forces, I don't think it's too much of an issue when it comes to getting shot out of spawn. Uh, I think it's more of an issue that, um, you know, getting torpedoed out of spawn. It doesn't happen at the lower echelons um, unless, once again, you've lost the battle and they're spawn camping you, uh, which is the same as in ground forces, but in higher tiers, you spawn in and you just start shooting again uh, and go after, you know, the enemy straight out of spawn. So I, d I really don't think it's that much of an issue. I know a lot of people like... It is an issue. I'm not one of them. Uh, I'm not a people. I'm not a person who thinks this. Uh, I feel like a lot of the time when I'm being spawn camped, it's because the battle is already lost and I shouldn't have spawned in. I should have uh, addressed the situation better and worked from there. The next question is, do you have plans to review the uh, HUD to give more info about hits and rewards? Maybe it's worth moving the data somewhere on another part of the screen. And the answer is, we will consider the suggestion. I think it's fine. Uh, the, the HUD is okay when it comes to hits and stuff like that. One thing I would like is, for some reason in aircraft, there is a lot of times where you get a critical, but it doesn't tell you what you have criticaled. That, to me, would be something that I would like changed. Um, I don't know what parts of the machines are being criticaled and that it's not showing up, whether it's fuel tank, whether it's oil, whether it's water, whatever it is. It would be nice to know what I've done to the enemy aircraft in order to critical it, so therefore, you know, we can work from there. Um, I think, generally, a hit cam would be nice in aviation, just like it is in for ground and naval, but overall, I think that the hood's fine it, it gives you enough information i don't want more stuff on the screen you know I, I feel generally there is enough stuff on the screen already i don't want more added to it uh, so yeah um I, I think it's okay so overall the majority of questions are actually pretty good uh, talking a lot about top tier and also bringing up questions such as the m60 uh, which we've uh, you know talked about before but it's nice to see it back and a lot of a lot of good questions uh, answered the two which are disappointing are obviously the naval forces question because it obfuscates uh, what's actually going on in the game mode and the stormer one i think is uh <laughs> I, the Stormer one is, the the way it's written is very, very uh, sad, uh, because it once again tries to obfuscate what is going on. One of the things that would help massively when it comes to these Q&As would be base statistics uh, to work from. Unfortunately, we don't really have base statistics uh, when it comes to any of these. When, Like if they wanted to talk about queue times or if they wanted to talk about the efficiency of the Stormer, they should be able to provide something to show that it, even if it is statistics which make absolutely no sense, it would at least show where their mind is when it comes to these decisions. Uh, so that would be something I'd like in the future, but I would like to thank Vacheslav Bulanikov for taking his time to do these Q&As. I think they're very important for the community, and it's nice to see that we are continuing with them. As always, I hope you all have a wonderful day, and I'll see you next time. I'd like to thank Ambrosius McClellan, B. Young, Battling Bacon, Blackie, Chris Giltnane, Conte Baraka, Daniel Stanton, E. Love Goat, J. Wilt, Martinez, Trigger Hippie, Universe, Eugens Terry, and also AI'm Devilish and Samuel Slick for supporting the channel.